Hey guys. Well, it's starting to creep into becoming a dark and stormy night here <clears throat> in the collapse of global industrial civilization and everything else. <clears throat> I don't know when I'm going to be putting out this video, but right now it is now going on 10 o'clock at night on uh, Wednesday, August 23rd. 2023 as we plow ahead through our history making five part chronicle of the collapse uh, where I am reading every word of the single most spot on analysis of the collapse of everything unfolding in the 21st century that I have ever read in my entire life. And uh, I want to thank Yahoo News and Popular Mechanics for <clears throat> leading me to this plum from uh, my hero, ecologist William Reese, who I have had the pleasure of interviewing before. And maybe at some point we'll get William back on the show. Uh, but William <coughs> Reese has come up with his, uh, with his magnus opus out of some outfit, never heard of it, simply called World, called World, where uh, William Reese spells out for any clueless moron, any doomer in training whatsoever, uh, whatever you want to call yourself, uh, about how the world works. And the name of this book-length essay, and is this, I think this is part four, uh, in this video, the name of this tome <clears throat> is The Human Ecology of Overshoot. Why a major population correction is inevitable. And so we have already gone through the introduction. We've read the chapter, The Nature and Nurture of Overshoot. <coughs> then we have connected some more dots with the population connection. In part two and part three, <coughs> we read the chapter on energy gradients. Homo sapiens as a dissipative structure, where William got a little bit uh, off into the 50 cent words. So maybe he will come back to us people who speak in five cent words. Uh, <laughs> in part four, so come back, William, to uh, a more lay audience, and I guess we're going to talk, bring in the clueless moron aspect of what is going on on the planet today, and this is, this chapter is titled, The World's Response to overshoot, which of course is ironic. Uh, the, the world's complete lack of response to overshoot. My guess is that one-tenth of one percent of the world's eight billion people could define overshoot in, in any sort of uh, understanding. Overshoot Ted Turner defined it uh, 30 years ago. Overshoot is too many people eating too much stuff. And then William would add to that and polluting. <coughs> too many people eating too much stuff and polluting the planet. So anyway, and I am thrilled to see the, uh, you know, each chapter has an opening quote and we hear from this fellow that I have done several uh, readings from, a fellow who writes for Medium.com, I guess it's a man, might be a woman, 
calling himself or herself B. B. Kind of the Sam Karana of doom, I guess. So uh, I'm glad to see that William Reese is a fan of the enigmatic B. But this is what B has to say about the world's response to overshoot. Look, overshoot is overshoot. Once your civilization starts to consume more than what naturally gets regenerated in its folly to pursue infinite growth on a finite planet, collapse is only a matter of time. Close quote. Thank you, B. Okay. <coughs> Bill Reese, what is the world's response or lack thereof to overshoot? Humanity's evolutionary trajectory and our recent period of industrial expansion have obviously generated a truly unique eco-predicament for humanity. Humans are innately expansionist, and modern industrial technological culture is growth-addicted, but material growth on a finite planet must eventually cease. The most encouraging sign of awakening to this contradiction is that an international planned degrowth movement is gathering momentum, particularly in Europe. Even members of the European Parliament are openly concerned about the risks associated with continued economic growth. Such concerns are stimulated by increasing numbers of science-based analyses and popular reports that even without mentioning overshoot, broach the possibility that modern techno-industrial societies are facing economic and population collapse. And then, uh, you know, obviously throughout this paper, uh, Bill Reese uh, links you to dozens and dozens and dozens of other uh, people before him, uh, you know, helping form his uh, worldview of, of how the world works. It's not like uh, Bill Reese is pulling this out of the air, okay? Uh, we have, a, I think, maybe close to a hundred footnotes. I could spend the rest of my life chasing down the footnotes. Anyway, societal collapse is a complex, controversial subject. There is no consistent definition. However, there is consensus. Okay, uh, I know that colony of cells loves the word consensus. There is consensus that collapse can be rapid or take decades, but invariably involves a significant loss of socio-political and economic complexity, including the dissolution and replacement of formal governments. Significant population decline is possible even with regional collapses. There is a considerable history of associating collapse with overpopulation and competition for scarce resources. Those clueless morons who doubt that collapse is a real possibility should remember that many regional human societies have imploded in the past and that modern techno-industrial societies are now so tightly entangled that the next contraction may well be global. 
in a rational world, the international community would act cooperatively and decisively in response to evidence of overshoot and organize to eliminate its corrosive impacts. Reg regrettably, nothing of the kind is occurring. Hmm. <clears throat> nothing of the kind is occurring. Modern techno-industrial society does not even acknowledge overshoot. On the contrary, most industrialized countries and even the mainstream environmental movement retain their simplistic foci on climate change and both seem determined to find ways of maintaining the perpetual growth trajectory. Some environmentalists do urge rapid disinvestment from and the ab abandonment of coal, oil, and natural gas. However, aggressive moves to reduce fossil fuel use by even the Paris, Paris Climate Agreement's minimal 45% by 2030 would co constitute political, if not societal, suicide. Thank you very much. In the absence of viable energy alternatives and a comprehensive socioeconomic restructuring plan backed by public support. Everything in the modern world depends on the continuity of energy supplies. Thus, rapid fossil fuel cutbacks would result in economic chaos. This is the word, his word to the just stop oil, uh, clueless moron movement, uh, that the, the, the just stop oil, and I'm throwing Greta Thunberg a little bit into this, uh, too clueless to follow through on this no shit Sherlock line of thinking. Take it away, William Reese, one more time. Rapid fossil fuel cutbacks would result in economic chaos, reduced goods production, massive unemployment, broken supply chains, failing GDP, declining personal incomes, overwhelmed social services, etc. Food production would plummet. Essential marine and diesel powered inner city transportation would falter. There would be local famines, mass migrations, and a global food shortage exacerbated by continuing climate change, civil disorder, and geopolitical chaos. Even if, even if atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations were to stabilize, there is already an additional 0.6 C warming in the pipeline due to short-term feedback such as the thermal inertia of the oceans. This alone will take the world over the one and a half C warming limit and further destabilize the climate. All of which helps explain why most of modern technical industrials senior governments, urban administrations, international organizations, many academic analysts, and even environmental organizations have adopted an alternative two-track strategy oriented to maintaining the status quo 
as follows. Track 1. Rather than abandoning fossil fuels, governments are maintaining subsidies to fossil fuel development. Indeed, subsidies in 2022 were double those of the previous year. Consequently, even the International Energy Agency expects that the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix will remain above 60% even in 2050. This will keep our industrial Titanic afloat until track two can be fully realized or until economically extractable fossil fuels are depleted. So what is track two? <laughs> I think we know it's coming. Track two, running parallel to track one. <clears throat> Meanwhile, seduced by the promise of cheap, 100% renewable energy, the world has also bought into a new mythic construct, the so-called renewable energy transition. Uh -huh. Under such banners as the Green New Deal, the circular economy, and the oxymoronic concept of green growth, <coughs> modern techno-industrial societies are striving to electrify everything and drive investment into so-called renewable green energy sources, particularly wind turbines, solar panels, and most recently, hydrogen, none of which are truly green, along with corresponding infrastructure and applications such as electric vehicles. All such approved technologies, including as yet unproved carbon capture and storage technologies, involve massive capital investment, significant job creation, and excellent opportunities for profit, <clears throat> i.e. everything necessary to maintain growth-oriented business as usual by alternative means. Arguably, the mainstream modern techno-industrial approach is designed to make industrial capitalism appear to be the solution to rather than a cause of the problem. <clears throat> Regrettably, the overall modern techno-industrial strategy of ecology, energy, material, and technology blind tantamount to electrifying the Titanic as if this would melt the icebergs. <clears throat> as already noted, the much vaunted green energy transition has arguably barely started and is mired in controversy. See the rebuttals to Siebert and Reese about, you know, rebuttals to uh, when he was mentioning this in an earlier study. <coughs> uh, its most ebullient proponents ignore important technical issues, ecological and social impacts, and problems stemming from the massive scale of the exercise, i.e., they ignore overshoot. In a nutshell, wind and solar technologies are actually not renewable, they're merely replaceable. Their production from mine head through manufacturing to installation is itself fossil energy intensive, so the transition in the best case 
will generate at least a short-term bump in carbon emissions. They cannot deliver the same quantity and quality of energy as fossil fuels and their life cycles including orders of magnitude increases in mining and refining activities for certain crucial rare minerals entail massive ecological degradation and so far egregious social injustice. Several authorities have calculated that there are simply not enough economic material deposits or adequate time to replace the existing fossil fuel powered system with renewable technologies on the schedule set by the IPCC reports and advanced by the Paris and subsequent climate agreements. Various climate scientists refer to net zero by 2050 as involving yet another collection of magical yet unworkable technical non-solutions to the climate conundrum or as not just a goal but a strategy for COP26 to lock in many decades of unnecessary fossil fuel use well past 2050 and creating unacceptable risks of unstoppable climate warming. Remember, track one entrenches the fossil fuel addiction. Indeed, 50 years after the publication of Limits to Growth, several f formal scientist warning, warnings to humanity, 27 United Nations COP meetings on climate, and several agreements on emissions reductions, the mainstream approach has so far failed to do anything significant to reduce global fossil fuel use and associated emissions. Instead, human-induced global warming rates are, are, are at their highest historical levels and the world can expect to reach and exceed the one and a half C global warming within the next 10 years. I'm surprised uh, Bill's giving it 10 years to pass one and a half. I think we're already there. In this light, track one of the modern techno-industrial strategy is potentially catastrophic. Continued use of fossil fuels means there is virtually no possibility that the world will achieve the Paris Agreement target to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 45 percent from 2010 levels by 2030 and virtually none that the world will reach net zero emissions by 2050. Indeed, the UN reports that current national commitments will actually increase emissions by 10.6 percent by 2030. Not only will we blow past the 1.5 C mean global warming limit of the Paris Agreement, we are likely to exceed even the less stringent 2 C degree limit by 2050. We are already on track for 2.4 to 2.8 C degree warming by century's end. Atmospheric greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, are still increasing. Meanwhile, climate change has already put about 9% of people, more than 600 million, outside the historic safe human climate niche and 2.7 C global warming 
could push about one third of humanity outside the niche. This does not account for threshold effects. Even two sea warming may well trigger irreversible runaway hothouse earth conditions ending prospects for global civilization. Local ecosystems and possibly the ecosphere as a whole are similarly prone to abrupt, unpredictable, irreversible changes that are potentially hostile to human and other life if pushed beyond unknown tipping points. Even under the best case scenario, track one leads the world to more and longer heat waves and droughts, more violent tropical storms, extended wildfire seasons, accelerating desertification, and water shortages. In many respects, 2023 is turning out to be a record-breaking archetypal demonstration of what the future will bring. Many regions on several continents are suffering record heat waves and drought or unprecedented precipitation and floods, and at the time of writing, over 900 wildfires are raging, most out of control in the boreal forest of Canada and many more in the forest of Siberia. As parts of the planet become uninhabitable, we should expect faltering agriculture, food shortages, and possibly extended famines. Rising sea levels over the next century will flood many coastal cities with the breakdown of national highway and marine transportation networks. Other networks, other cities are likely to be cut off from food, from food lands, energy, and other essential resources. Some large metropolitan areas will become unsupportable and not survive the century. Even in 2021, at least 414 cities with a total 1.4 billion plus inhabitants were deemed to be at high or extreme risk from a combination of pollution, dwindling water supplies, extreme heat stress, and other vulnerabilities to climate change alone. Which brings us back to the faltering track to and overshoot. Barring an all-out nuclear holocaust, one could argue that the only thing worse than the failure of Track 2's so-called green renewable energy transition would be its success. Developing another assured supply of abundant, cheap energy would simply allow for the extension of growth-based business as usual by alternative means, increasing the, deep, the depletion and dissipation of the natural world and worsening overshoot. And more and more, guys, I am beginning to think that this, uh, you know, just what he said, you know, obviously the worst thing that could happen to this planet is if the green renewable transition is a success and not the failure that it's going to be. Uh, okay, I'm not sure who he's quoting here from one of his footnotes. Would have been nice if he had uh, said who this is. You can look it up. It is human nature to intensify our exploitation of fossil fuels 
metals and non-metallic minerals in order to perpetuate our industrial lifestyle paradigm for as long as possible. Paradoxically, the more vigorously we strive to perpetuate our unsustainable industrialized way of life, the more quickly and thoroughly we will deplete Earth's remaining non-renewable and renewable reserves, thereby hastening and exacerbating our global societal collapse. And again, that is footnote number 93, where you can find the rest of that report. <clears throat> Ironically then, with the success of the Track 2 mission, the ecosphere would succumb within decades to irreversible degradation, disordering and dissipation, taking the global human enterprise with it, arguably a smaller contraction sooner is preferable to a massive one later. And of course, it would not be the first time. The prospect of societal collapse, however horrific it sounds to modern techno-industrial ears, is perfectly consistent with history and the systems dynamics characterizing the rise and fall of previous human civilizations. And particularly, many modern techno-industrialized nations are exhibiting the diminishing returns in socio-political pathologies egregious in increasing inequality, government and institutional incompetence and corruption, currency debasement, popular loss of confidence in the state, increasing civil unrest, etc. of an overly complex society on the verge of collapse as well as the potentially avoidable symptoms, ecological destruction, climate change, breakdown of trade and international relationships, and inability or unwillingness to adapt to changing circumstances of a society apparently choosing to fail. <clears throat> More generally, the stages of civilizational development and decay cataloged by Toynbee, Genesis, Growth, Time of Troubles, Universal State, and Disintegration are markedly similar to the phases of the repetitive cycles common to living systems. Initiation and exploitation, maturation and conservation, rigidification and release, i.e. collapse. Gunderson and Holling advance the panarchy theory to explore such cyclical change as a mechanism for adaptation common to complex ecosystems and social systems. They argue that each iteration of a naturally repeating cycle, e.g. the cyclical fire regime of certain forest ecosystems, theoretically provide opportunities for innovation and evolutionary adaptation. One is forced to wonder why modern Homo sapiens stubbornly fail to apply lessons from well-studied historic collapses to develop the foresight and the policy actions needed to head off the next one. <clears throat> On the contrary, many analysts reject historical precedents as guides to contemporary policy. Perhaps they should take warning from the aforementioned infamous 1970 Club of Rome MIT study limits to growth, 
which showed that on a business as usual track, global society would face collapse by mid 21st century. As might be expected, many economists and techno optimists roundly rejected the assessment. Economists ignore overshoot and even grossly underestimate the damage from climate change. Their concepts and models are divorced from biophysical reality. However, subsequent studies show that the real world is behaving with disturbing fidelity to limits to growth modeling, particularly the two or four scenarios that indicate a halt in growth over the next decade or so, followed by subsequent declines and collapse. And we are finally at the summary and conclusions. It is really quite simple. So we will get to the really quite simple summary and conclusions of uh, this epic piece of uh, collapsology literature by my hero William Reese coming up at some point in the near future. But right now I have a peach cobbler in the oven that needs to come out. Get out there and enjoy your peach cobbler while you still can. Bye guys.